advice. Okay, thank you, Omar, very much. And please, oh, yeah. now it should work also the black thing. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, guys. Forgot to mention that there's going to be a quiz. And before we start the class, it's going to be a quiz, and after the class, it's going to be another quiz. Just kidding, so no worries. Um, so today, we'll, we'll go through the second part of uh, what we were talking yesterday. So if you remember anything from yesterday, anything from yesterday, we covered kind of an introduction to the main concepts of knowledge graphs. Then we talk about construction and representation. Then uh, how can we use knowledge graph for information retrieval? And then we look at one example, very good example. Today, we'll go through two more examples. And then we're gonna finish with what I call design considerations in case you wanna do this for real. And then we're gonna finish it up. It's gonna be less, maybe less than yesterday, and, uh, but it's gonna be more, more around the use cases. All right, so this talk, this, this application is on top of uh, the SKG model that we talked yesterday. So to recap, the SKG was SKG social knowledge graph. And the idea was we just read it from the fire hose. And then we're gonna output a graph that contains four main nodes, topics, links, people, and then we're gonna do this over time. And I mentioned that yesterday over time, and you're gonna say why. So that's kind of the bulk of this idea. So this is the application. This application that uh, it's called story evolution or event evolution sits on top of the graph. So we're gonna traverse the graph to build an application. And now I know it sounds pretty crazy, but just uh, bear with me. So, so what is the goal here? Why we care? So if you're using Twitter, there's a lot of social posts uh, that will make it into a news article. And then when the news article goes to die, where the event goes to die, it's have a Wikipedia page. So imagine the US election, you have millions of tweets, you know, who is winning, who is losing my candidate, I hate this candidate, I love my candidate. And then there will be, uh, you know, some news articles on very important uh, newspapers. And then there's gonna be one, just one Wikipedia page that describes the US election. This goes to pretty much for every main event. Now the social posts are basically thousands, as I mentioned. Then you have some sort of 100, around hundreds of news articles, and then you have one Wikipedia page. And another way of reading the same transition is you have the planet, you have a few editors, and then even less number of Wikipedians. Remember, Wikipedians are the people who write the Wikipedia page. So you can already see you can have biases and you know people are gonna cut things and so forth. So this is kind of the planet, you know, you know, thousand folks, hundreds, and then even less number of people here. This is not to point fingers to say these guys are bad or they're bad, but it's just like you can see the, the amount of stuff that is getting, you know, filter and filter and filter and filter. Maybe without being harmful, but you know, just get filtered out. All right, so we're gonna uh, take another approach and, and, and our approach is, we'll call this uh, SN. So we're gonna look at a social network as basically as a human crawler. So if you're taking the information from a class, you're gonna build Google, you need a crawler, right? So a crawler is basically a piece of software that will just open a socket. So it's gonna go to, uh, CNN.com is going to open the, the web page. The main page is going to look for HREFs, which is basically links. And then it's going to take that link, add it to the keyboard, keep calling, right? And we need a crawler because if we got a crawler, then we just build an index based on that. And if we don't have a crawler, there's no way that you can build a search engine. That's kind of the precondition. So we're going to uh, look at Twitter basically as a human crawler. What does it mean? Like, you know, you all have a whole Twitter account, and once in a while you will share a link, right? So you say, "Hey, this is a this is a great talk. Here's a link to the to the URL." That is kind of a crawling. You're just telling me that this link is very good. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract all the links that have been shared in Twitter, 
uh, as the backbone of a particular story. Uh, and then we're going to automatically build a synthetic document and we're going to identify related stories. And this kind of synthetic document is going to be like a Wikipedia page. That's, that's kind of the, the, the nutshell of, of the approach. And the goal here is to build a database of stories or events. Okay, so it's a synthetic document, meaning like it's just you know automatically constructed. We're going to add what we call provenance and supporting evidence. Um, we'll show the evolution of the story. Um, we're going to show pivots, so then you can just play around, and then this is going to be used for archiving. So this is an example of what we want to do. This is a looks like a Wikipedia, right? It's exactly a wiki page. You have um, kind of an overview of the, of, of the document, and then here's the supporting evidence. So here's this person, you know, John Gabriel, who is telling you that hey, this link for some reason is useful, and then this is the link. So that's the article, and this, this person is supporting the evidence. And because of this, then you can build this, you know, see also or related topics. And then we'll show all the references, which are basically the references are extracted from these URLs. So this is our overall, we're going to spend like 10 minutes going through this in more detail. So what is our purpose for uh, kind of, you know, backend uh, uh, pipelining? So we're going to harvest basically all the data. So we have all the Twitter data. We're going to uh, expand two main uh, techniques from IR. One is called uh, pseudo-relevance feedback and it's called Fourier expansion. We we'll call them social pseudo-relevance feedback, social query expansion. And then we have a wikification algorithm. So in English, we read all the Twitter data. We're gonna perform basically an initial retrieval of the URLs. We're gonna get all these links from link one, link n. Then we're going to apply social, uh, social uh, relevance feedback and then social query expansion. We're going to rerun those links. And then we're going to run a wiki like uh, automatic generation of a page. And then we you know, output the page. So, this is kind of standard tricks in IR. You issue a query, you get a link, and then you don't like it. So, you run uh, relevance feedback or query expansion, and then you rerun. So, this is the same thing but we're going to use social signals um, and another important component of our technique is the, the notion of a coding data structure so if, you, if you're in twitter you know that you can like uh, so you can retweet or maybe you can do a fade on a, on a particular but the problem with that is it's going to create what we call artificial counters because you're over inflating a, a particular tweet so we, we did it, and I'm going to be super high level describe this, the different vote data structures where you vote different things. For example, you vote hashtag current with the tweet frequency, you vote how many times there's an engram with a retweet frequency, a link with retweet frequency, and so forth. So imagine like a record, like a C, you know, a strike record where you count different co-occurrences. So, how many times, for example, I have a connection, how many times there's an element, or in this case, an entity, and then the frequencies of the retweets, the RTs, the total tweets, et cetera, et cetera. It's a fine-grained way of computing counts, different type of counts. Then we're going to build a hashtag index. You're familiar with hashtags. So, and remember, we talked yesterday on how to extract engrams and summaries for those uh, links and hashtags. So we're going to the hashtag uh, index and show as relevant hashtags and links. And remember, we're, we have a graph on the cut, right? So we want to find the connection between the hashtag and associated information. Then we're going to have a signature of the link. So given a link, say, you know, cnn.com, blah, 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 we want to get all the chatter around that link. So we don't remember from yesterday. The idea is we're going to extract this link. Okay, ricochet.com slash 399 slash collection. So it has been shared 485 times and has been like uh, 33. And a lot of people may have written things around the link. So this guy is saying, you know, the election was not hacked, blah, 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 point to the link. 
We're going to extract all the chatter that points to the link from all these, you know, around 500 accounts. And that's going to be what we call the signature. Okay, so it's going to be the signature of the link. So we have a link and then all the chatter, the chatter from Twitter to that link. At the same time, we use exactly the same technique, but for a hashtag. And we call that a contextual vector. Contextual vector. So remember ISIS or Paris attacks yesterday? We have hashtag Paris attacks and all the engrams. That is the idea. And then as part of our SKG, we have um, a subset of tweets as well as supporting evidence. So this is an example of supporting evidence. Someone is telling you that this link is good, and here's the supporting evidence for that. All right, so this is kind of reusing the data that we could do in this. Uh, and then a uh, little bit on social pseudo relevancy. So this is an extension to the standard here uh, with contextual vectors and behavioral data. So we perform an initial retrieval of a set of links with the hashtag identity. So we need the hashtag as entry point for the entity. And we're going to use all the things that we know about the entity or the hashtag. And we're going to read write the query using our contextual vectors as extra signal as extra signal and then we're going to use the vote data structure that we have on number of tweets, retweets, vote, etc. to kind of reweight the things that we want and we're going to rewrite those links by this new score. Same idea for social query expansion we're going to extract similar hashtags with a specific time interval. In this case for example you may have a hash of Super Bowl because it was the game, but at the same time it was hash HB50. And only for 2016, these things are actually the same semantic living. Okay. If you move forward one year, 2017 is the same hashtag Super Bowl, but right now it's called SB51. And by the way, we're not making this up. This is what is the, the the Twitter sphere is going to be some. Now, uh, this, this is going to change uh, from game to game, or maybe next time, you know, they don't call it football, but something else. But we, you get the idea. For other things like State of the Union, so this is the famous uh, speech that the US president will just give you know, to the country, and the hashtag is State of the Union. You should don't have a, a year just like State of the Union. So you can grab all the state of the union uh, over a period of time. We're going to use a sim hash technique to basically just group all these guys together and then we're going to run uh, some analysis on the big query logs to also get similar queries. Then they all to say that we're going to get a lot of different expansions. So then we can expand the title, in this case, the hashtag title score, so we get the similarity of the title uh, given the query and the engrams, and it's called title. Then we have another score that is called RT, retweet title score, the similarity between the title, because it's title score, query related hashtags, this is RT. And then we have, in this case, the cluster expansion based on the query logs, another score for it, similarity, title, query, cluster expansion. And there's a bunch of these guys, just like you know, very little scores here and there. And then we uh, we combine. So this is another thing for the you know in the case of the uh, big score for the hashtags, we're going to get the maximum for the hashtags on the title, the hashtags on the description, the hashtags on the files. You know, all different very low level scoring mechanisms. All this is going to give us a number. For this, in this case, for the hashtag, but then we have titles and a bunch of other stuff. And then at the end, what we do is, you know, a big combination that takes all the scores for title, hashtags, retweets, etc., etc., times basically counters. And these counters are all based on behavioral data. How many times we retweeted, how many times we like, name, etc. So this is standard kind of like exp expansions on text times, you know, behavioral data. That's what we call it, <coughs> social query expansion and social relevance. Why we do this? Because we're going to get this interesting way of getting similar hashtags. And 
Similarity here is not your similarity on embeddings or you know, vector space. We want to capture similarity on a particular period that's key. Right, so here, for, for example, July 30, uh, 31st, this is heavily on US elections, by the way, uh, Trump versus Clinton. So the query was Clinton. Uh, it was the, the most important related hashtag was Hillary Clinton. And the second hashtag was Benghazi because she was associated with that particular topic. That is only valid for this period of time. If you go to September 27th, Clinton, hashtag slightly different now is Clinton email scandal and related to Comey resignation. Okay, so the point here is you don't want to have all these relationships forever. And the goal is to keep the similarity within the period of time. So these query expansions, think of it as kind of temporally available within a certain period of time. If politics sounds crazy in terms of the World Cup, okay, so there's a World Cup every four years and there's a winner every four years. So you wanna, you wanna kind of keep how relevant the goal scorer, who was the winner, whoever got, didn't make it, like if they didn't make it to the World Cup last time, it was only that time, hopefully we'll make it this, this time, okay. Uh, then we take Trump, which is the other candidate, Trump train, that was a related hashtag on uh, August the 4th. MAGA means make America great again. Uh, on 16, it was Trump nation, and hashtag Trump army. Uh, Bernie, which is the other candidate, you know, Bernie of Bust was basically October the 2nd because he was leaving. Uh, and it was related to millennials because all the millennials love Bernie. And then in November, it was like, shouldn't be Bernie. You know, we still believe Bernie's the guy, so still Sanders. Um, let me just feel a little bit explaining the contextual vectors before getting to uh, entertainment. And every hashtag will have kind of like the engrams that summarize the hashtag. So that you get that, you know, uh, why, you know, they say should be Bernie, why it's termination, the scandals, and so forth. And this is an example of Stubble. Uh, Rogue One was, you know, the, the movie, and for that day it was like, hey, there's, there's a you know, new movie, it starts tomorrow, etc., etc. and you didn't get Rogue One related to Star Wars. Okay. Now, on December 26, Rogue One was because it was related to the death of Carrie Fisher, who played Leila, and and that was rest in peace with Jesus. What are we trying to say here? Which is that there's, there's meaning that is temporally related. So when you see hashtag or certain entities, sometimes they're connected because they're, the connection is valid within a particular period of time. Don't care about this because if you go to Twitter and if you say, I search for Rogue One, you want to, in this case, expand to Star Wars. But if you're searching, for Rogue One, this period of time you want to expand to Leila or Fisher or the Princess. Okay, we have all the underlying things. We're going to basically derive the evolution of the story. So, if you think in terms of the US elections, we don't want one week page that says Trump won over Clinton. We want to know what was the process for the candidates, what happened, how did he actually evolve over time. So we're going to piggyback on our uh, hashtag index. We're going to go through all the hashtags over time t, and then we're going to basically do this elastic expansion, which I was basically describing here. So we're going to go through this over time, and every time we see a query and hashtags and vectors, we can expand. And with that expansion, we're going to get more or less things. Okay, oops. So we, we do all these expansions and then we're going to re-rank those things according to social um, pseudo relevance feedback. And then we're going to compute a timeline. And if we happen to have a, a link that is not as part of the timeline, we add it. And if we do have the link already on the timeline, then we just take another link. And we have all this incredible amount of uh, components that we already built in terms of data assets, we can already 
build the queries that will trigger results. Cool, right? So we're kind of done at the end. And the final piece is the wikification. So this will be an example of the uh, evolution story. So we have a TOC, which is the table of contents. We have the story, how the story evolves. Um, we have related stories, which are of the seals or the pivots. Then we have the sources, which are you know all the uh, references that we're using to construct the story. Um, where's the related evidence, uh, the supporting evidence? If someone you know kind of there's a heavily shared link about Trump, then we're basically adding the supporting evidence. This is the Fox News. You may like it, you may dislike it, but we don't care. So we don't take a stance that this is left left wing or right, which is you know put everything on the same back, and then. We're saying somebody said this, and this is the source that is actually saying that. Uh, this is Fox News, then we extract those Fox News, you can check the references. And uh, furthermore, you can compute stuff to see how diverse the story was created. And in our paper, we show that you know, we're more diverse than, than an original Wikipedia page. And finally, because we have all these things, we can automatically write the queries. And those are the queries that hopefully, if you get a query about this, US elections, whatever, will show you this story. Now, we're going to consume this. This is kind of very research. It's just a way of showing the evolution of the story. So, how do we consume this? Uh, I'll get back to this in a second. How do we consume this? This is an old story, but this is basically how it was consumed as part of the research. I'll get to this in a second, but uh, you have this kind of raw data that shows the story and then it get consumed uh, in being what's called the rundown. So this is like the, the most important articles about the story and each important. This is just for like a white volcano. And this is for uh, the tax, uh, sorry, the, the tax reform. So this is the original page that we built internally, the Wikipedia page about the uh, tax reform. And these are the main links that then get extracted and Kind of we uh, presented in a different way uh, as part of the rundown. So that was pretty cool, you know, because we built everything that was used by Bing and not longer at Microsoft. And uh, Google basically also copied our, our idea of showing this uh, context. This is mostly to give you context, so not just to point to the latest article on tax reform, but to give you context how the thing has been evolved. Um, a little bit of the comparison this is. Our, uh, there was a, a big fire in the, in the West Coast, uh, it's called Sonoma Fires, that's uh, Napa County, Wine County in California. And this is the page that we built, um, and this is the comparison of our page compared to the original official Wikipedia article, and our kind of timeline was exactly, exactly the same time. All right, so I just give you uh, an example of how to use AG, which was the uh, knowledge graph to build an application on uh, story evolution. This is completely different. We're going to look at a different graph on, uh, for, for doing brands and products. Very, very simple. Why would we care? It's a very simple graph that contains three main notes brands, Nike, products, running shoes, categories, and parallel. And the idea here is you want to search for a brand. Okay, I'm going to search for Microsoft. I want to return all the products that you know, Microsoft sells. Office, Surface, I see one. Windows. I'm looking for a product, say, for example, Kings, and I want to return all the brands. I want to see if there's Calvin Klein, there's, you know, Levi's. I'm looking for a category, smartphones, and I want to get all the related products. iPhone, Galaxy, Pixel, from Google. And that, that's basically the scenario. So I want to go from different angles. And this is important because you can use this for ads. Okay, so you're going to show an ad. It's like depending on what are the queries, then I can grab ads that satisfy your information need. And at the same time, a product can be an official, you know, physical product like Adidas Samba, which is a pair of sneakers. It could be insurance or it could be food delivery. Um, and by doing this, you can also identify things like competitors. For example, here, if I say smartphones, I already know that iPhone, Samsung, and, and Google, they do compete on this particular category. Very useful. 
Uh, you can get related products, related brands, and also identify related uh, product factors. All right, so what's the problem with this thing? This is very, very dynamic. So this is not about who's the person in the United States, you know, Hillary Clinton or Trump or Biden. These things change a lot, you know. Brands will change, products will change. In particular, products they do appear and disappear a lot. So you got a new product, nobody buys the product because people forget about it. Not a lot of stuff is on Wikipedia. So Nike, Adidas are going to be Wikipedia for small business owners. None of this information is in Wikipedia. So it's kind of very difficult to find uh, an authoritative source, like we talked yesterday, on clean data about products and brands. And sometimes it's extremely hard to define and detect product. Is iPhone a product? Yeah, but people call it also kind of a brand. It's, it's called Apple iPhone or iPhone. Very blurred, right? So, you know, very, very, you know, distinction between brands and products. And if you happen to work with a retailer, sometimes it will give you some data, but a lot of times it's just very, very difficult. So how we did it? Unsupervised, okay, it's just kind of, a, you know, it's not, you know, using labels, very unsupervised. We look at the quality, very simple, very simple way of doing this. We're going to first get the brands. I'll explain that. Then we'll, we're going to tag the brand with categories, and from that, we'll get the products. So remember, our, our graph is on three entities, brands, products, and categories. So we'll go with brands first. We'll try to get some of the categories and categories hopefully we'll try to get the products and then we'll tie everything together. Spend quite a bit of time on this. All right, so the first one is to how do we detect this brand? Um, voting. So we're going to use N and of sources. So think of this as um, give me an example of an Italian brand. Gucci. Gucci. So then we can say, uh, let's listen to that many sources. So the idea here is that just ask each of the sources as an article, is good for you? Yes or no, or yes or no. So we're going to ask each of these end sources to tell us if the token seems to be a, a, a brand. So every source is going to sign one that yes, to recognize this is brand or not. And then another, like we take a majority vote or a threshold. And we say, well, it looks like, you know, overall, this seems to be a brand, so that's good. And then um, we're going to assume this brand, but there's some specific cases, like, for example, you may say Apple, it's a brand, but uh, Apple Inc. is also a brand. And then um, you have Bose, Bose Audio, you have Gap, but other people also call that the Gap Inc. So, you know, terms analysis, remember yesterday we have, you know, acronyms and different ways of mentioning the same entity. So we're going to piggyback also on the domains. So we know that if a lot of people, every time they issue the query Apple, they land on Apple.com. Every time they issue the query Apple, then they also land on Apple.com. That's an indication that these two guys are the same. Both, both audio, gap, the gap, etc. Gap is complicated because some of this, uh, Brands will have different domains, gap.com, gapin.com, etc. As you can see, you know, things is very, it's very, very complicated. For simple things like Adidas and Nike or Gucci, maybe they're super easy to see, but there's many, many complications. So at the end, we're just going to provide scores, then we threshold, and we say, yeah, looks like a brand. And by the way, this is a supporting evidence because the domain is official and it's available and so forth. All right. So we got the brands, we're going to go down and get the categories. So we're going to use this sequence. So from the brand, Apple or Gucci will get, you know, Gucci.com, assuming that is the, the official URL. We're going to get all the queries that point to that URL, Gucci.com. We're going to categorize all the queries. We're going to perform an aggregation of all the categories. And at the end, we'll get your categories. Why we're we saying this? Because you have probably many, many that will land in Gucci.com and then we need to classify them with the goal of hopefully at the end, it's mostly about apparel or fashion. And, and the reason why we use query logs is because 
we need to get massive volume and data so then we're you know comfortable uh, probably and we're speaking that this is the category for the brand which is somewhat easier but if you think in terms of apple what do you think are the main categories for apple ask a question for the you know, young audience you have to categorize the product that Apple sells. One in the front. That's not a problem. That's not a category, that's a problem. The categories. Smart. Smart. What else? Tablets. What is the tablet? What? What is the tablet? Electronics. What else? What else do they sell? What what else do they sell? Hardware. What else? Access. Access. You're still missing a very important. You so have software. Software. No, software. no, computer no hardware. You know what? They're super popular in you know a lot of services. No fashion. Why? Because of the watch. Yeah, you have to know this, right? So you're gonna do that by, by, by getting all these categories. So the fact that you're buying an Apple watch, and if you categorize the watch, it's fashion. Believe it or not, it's categorized as fashion. All right, so we're going to get all this, you know, the probability of a category given the brand, the probability of a query given the URL, you know, blah, 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 to compute, you know, all these probability distributions of a given brand. So given a brand, you can have this probability distribution of all the categories that are associated with a particular brand. And also, we can tell you what popular, you know, the brand popularity. So we do this for all the brands. Then we can rank. Same way, you know, CNN or Facebook.com are the most popular domains. Then we can tell you what's the brand for product. That's cool, right? So we did brands, we did categories, and now the difficult part is the products. So uh, two approaches here. So we're going to go uh, to get some sort of products from the catalog. So catalog, you know, is like the company. In this case, they put you or Apple will tell you we sell all these things. The problem is sometimes they don't give you that information, so you have to try to get some of that input. So we perform some sort of a grouping of products within each brand. Then we did, you know, standard ML here, like you know, a semantic model. We train on products ads to embed the product names. We run clustering and k-means to to kind of Different variations from the sizes and so forth uh, to get you know uh, a representative set of M labels that hopefully will describe our products. That was one approach. The second approach was to use you know products from beaded keywords. So if you're an advertiser, say Gucci, and you want to show now that Microsoft name or Google, this is a uh, handbag or boots or whatever. And if you know the user clicks on the uh, Gucci ads for handbags to say that it will work for me. So we're going to do, we're going to use also those keywords and we get all well, the keywords that are matched to the brand. We have a sort of an engrams from the keywords and then we build a, a language models using, you know, KL divergence. All these are things that you cover on the artifacts. Okay, all these, each of these entries basically a chapter in the book or a technique we use pretty much every single to get props. So now that we have the brands, we have the categories, we have the products, voila, we have a graph. Um, and the way we, did, we build this is, is completely unsupervised from the bottom up. So then if you have new sources of data, you can plug it in. And the goal was simplicity and data cleaning because this was used in the big search engine. This thing called scopes, cosmos is basically a map reviews. So if you're familiar with the Google, on map reviews, the equivalent of Microsoft store, Cosmos store, that's all for reference. All right, graph number three. This is the last one, guys. Um, a little bit of knowledge graph for healthcare, and I'm going to spend time saying why some of these things are problematic. So healthcare domain, in general, it's, uh, it's scientific knowledge is extremely well understood. People really know about these things. A bit of the problem is there's different events every time you go to the doctor. You have a problem, you know, there's a disorder, the doctor may have a finding, they find something on you, they're going to prescribe you a medication. 
Uh, you may have to go to uh, the hospital to get a lab. <clears throat> if things don't look good, you have to go under the knife, right? So you know, you know, do some sort of a surgery. In any case, there's a lot of events. Think of this as kind of uh, the information need for the patient. You may have different information needs. Now, this is all good, and there's been a lot of people working on uh, medicine and notographs and you know, searching for medical content, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, telemedicine was even you know, super popular before COVID, but let me just expand a little bit more on before and after. So I was working at a startup where we're doing something um, in this space. And um, before COVID, they were like, yeah, you know, I can do e health, you know, have a conversation with my doctor. But with COVID, it basically exploded. Okay, so you cannot go to the doctor. So you can do telemedicine, just turn on the TV, Zoom, or go hang out, whatever. At the same time, how about if I'm in the middle of nowhere? So maybe I should download an app and then I chat. Not with the doctor, but a chat with the system that says, you know, I am well. So the chat says, what's happening? It's like, well, I cannot breathe. Okay, and uh, what about this, what about that? So obviously there's a bit of an AI and it recovers. Uh, and things get really, really bad. Yeah, I cannot do anything, and so you get a doctor in the loop. But you can imagine how this can be useful. This is not just because of COVID, but imagine you're in the middle of nowhere, and uh, you have to drive like you know, two hours to get to the hospital. <clears throat> Maybe you're kind of sick, so you don't want to do this, right? So there's plenty of opportunities for automating these things. Plenty. Let's go through each of them. And this falls under the umbrella of clinical management. So this is kind of managing your data as doctors. Okay, so we all. We're all going to die. So we all going to go through this. And the idea here is can, how can you manage data the same way you know, you're managing your, your uh, transcripts uh, every time you go through university or your payroll, you want to get paid. This is the same thing. You know, you can manage all the clinical data. And one of those things is the idea of charting an encounter. It sounds like crazy, but an encounter is every time. In the US, you see, uh, say I, I'm sick or I have a headache, but it's an encounter. And all those things are getting charged. So they have to capture your, that conversation with the physician. So, one thing, um, I'm going to kind of give you the analogy, kind of the numbers, and then what I'm talking, I'll give you where the uh, non giraffe can help. The first one is to imagine that you run an NER. An the recognition that we're talking on, we were talking about Bill Gates and Microsoft yesterday on uh, an initial complaint from the patient. So you basically say, I'm having nausea. No, you want to basically to tag nausea as any app, but that entity is only valid for this, right? Because if I say, if I'm tagging, you know, IMDB data, and I want to tag that the Godfather is the title, it's just like this. It's like something different. It's only valid in, in medicine, right? So you want to detect medical and clinical entities. That's one thing. Why you want to do this? Because believe it or not, a lot of the physicians basically run some sort of a classifier, right? Because they ask what about this, what about that? Short term space, the search space, so then they can try to get the probabilities of what you have. So here is okay, if you because you need to go to the doctor or the emergency room right now versus like, that's just a cough, that's fine, come back. To right? So you want to get these things because you're going to classify the, the degree of importance that you have to go in person to the hospital, see a physician, etc. etc. As you're doing this, then you can run some sort of diagnosis based on probabilities that this might be COVID, this might be a heart attack, this might be a broken bone, etc. And if you're building a chat server, so this is what the, the physician or the doctor is asking you. So they ask you a lot of follow ups. You feel this, what about this, what about that? You're always answering. And, and if you get a question sometimes, you know, the physician just you know, answers things like, it's fine, just a flu, just what they say. Okay, good. 
And at the end, once you're done with the visit, so that your encounter, the physician is going to basically summarize, you know, what was the main theme of the conversation. Cholesterol is high, you know, need to get back in the month. We need to run some lab tests. Okay. okay. The idea here is like getting a lot of and can we use the knowledge graph to automate as much as we can? And this is to replace the physician. We're not trying to get rid of the doctor here, but the point is can we help the doctor? Can we just you know, provide as much information as possible in some sort of a chat session or machine learning or AI? So then the doctor has the best picture of you, the patient, but like very user as well. So that's kind of the goal here of clinic and clinic and management. And there's like many companies working on it. This is the US, a lot of hospitals also. And you can imagine because this kind of charting takes a lot of time, right? And it's not for legal reasons. That's how they're going to build you. Um, you know, uh, that's that's an insurance. So there's a lot of you know uh, time spent doing charting. Where's the data? It's plenty of data, an incredible amount of data, which is also a challenging part here. Because you have, first of all, this is medicine. So, you know, you have to be a little bit precise, like the bone is broken or not. You have to kind of be very specific. Uh, you know, you have appendicitis or not. So it's like, you know, maybe you realize, maybe no, but you know, it's just, you're going to go under the knife and then you'll find out. It's like, no, 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 you have to be very precise. So for doing that, there's a thing called UMLS, Unified Medical Language, very specific in medicine. You have also SNOMED, which is you know, different ways of saying things. Uh, you have Rx Norm, this is a database of drugs and all the chemical information about drugs. Uh, you have LINK, which is medical lab observations. You have NASH, which is subject headings, you know, the taxonomy for medicine. And by the way, I'm only showing you a handful. There's an incredible amount of data sources, you know, uh, databases of pretty much whatever you want. And you can see that integration is going to be a nightmare because all these things point to different pieces and having a, a unified view here is very, very complex. Also, this data is very sensitive. Okay. So this is now playing TV. This is now the iPhone from Amazon. I don't want people to look at my medical record, only in my position. At least in the US, very, very sensitive. And it goes into this uh, EHR, which is uh, electronic health records. You also have, if you think in terms of search, the problem of clinical relevance. So we all talk about relevance, you know, okay, the user information you need, you need a keyword, or do the best. But there's a vocabulary mismatch, right? Because you can go to Doctor, say what's happening. You say, you know, I felt like uh, you know, an elephant is sitting on top of my chest. Okay, that would be an indication that you have like a three heart attack because you have a lot of pressure. But you have the medical terminology that you know the MD describes medically what you, what you're saying, and then you're just saying, I feel bad, I cannot breathe, I have a, an elephant sitting on my chest. Etc. Etc. And those point to the same thing, right? But this is a vocabulary research. And finally, if you're going to do data labeling in terms of relevance assessments or machine learning, who's going to do this? A nurse, a you, you no know, crowdsourcing, you no know, mechanical kind of expert. This is you need an expert, right? Because if you have, I don't know, um, some kind of a brain tumor, you want somebody who actually knows about that, to actually label those documents and label those procedures. So, you know, hard. Curation is even harder because you need like real experts to do this. So, I'm just kind of outlining the challenges. You know, a lot of interesting topics, a lot of research, but this is hard. Hard, hard. All right, we're going to wrap up. With, oh, I think I just hit up a little bit, which is fine. We can have some time for discussion. It's 12, right, Emily? We're finishing at 12. Okay, so we're going to wrap up a little bit there. Apologize if I speed it up.
happy to answer more questions. The last piece of the uh, presentation was about design considerations. So we, you know, we went through a lot of different uh, knowledge graphs. How do we push that? So how do we push that? Oh, wow. There's no single approach to build a knowledge graph. So if you're building a compiler, you have to build a lexical analyzer, you have to build a parser, you have to build the code generator, you have to build the uh, optimizer of the code generator, and the final you know, code. And there's a book by you know, uh, Jeff Woolman and uh, I go to describe exactly how to build a compiler. This is different. Every person has a different opinion on how to build a knowledge graph, which I think is interesting, but also sometimes frustrating because there's not a recipe. Everybody has different perspectives. You have the research products and then the engineering products. So we're going to talk a little bit more on the engineering side of it. So how do we boost that? So you have to think basically some sort of a, a, an iterative development cycle where you think in three main pieces, content, infrastructure, and applications. So say that you know we want to build a knowledge app for IMDB, okay, the internet, uh, the internet movie database. So our content is going to be mostly uh, documents about movies, directors, actors, and so forth. Focus on the content, and we described yesterday the content has to be top notch, has to be clean, you know, from authoritative sources, etc. Et That's cool. Second part is the infrastructure. What do we need? Can we use the database? Can we use AWS, Neptune, GraphQL? We're going to have to pick one of them. And then the other one is the application. What's our application? We're going to do search. We're going to do recommendations. We're going to show ads. Uh, we're going to answer questions about movies. What do we want to do? But we have to think of this three axes. Okay? This is not a sequence, but we have to think of those three axes. We have many, many choices. The first one is we can go semantic web like with the RDF, which is you know, resource description frameworks, we can use Owl, we can use Spark. Okay, that's one way. We can use another one, which is key values. Those are the Microsoft are all key values. There's no Sparkle, there's no RDF, there's massive text files. A text file is basically a key value. I'll show you some. Which is fine, you know, it's a graph as well. Another approach is to use just standard. <laughs> oh, we're doing we're doing cipher. Yeah, uh, I'm worried. Uh, okay, here we go. All right back. Yeah. All right. In practice, we'll basically uh, do a hybrid where we're going to put certain pieces of the graph on the applications in all these different variations. Another super crucial part of building the graph is the notion of a workflow. In a workflow, the idea here is that we're going to remember the architecture that we showed yesterday that I showed you very, very complex, you know, you know, boxes and arrows to build the graph. We're going to run that thing automatically. And the idea here is that the graph is always going to the same way as the web. So there's always a new page that has been added, another page that has been deleted. And the research engine will just take a snapshot, we build page rank or whatever. So here's the same idea. The graph is always under construction, always under construction. And then what we do is we need to have a mechanism that's going to rebuild the graph from scratch in, in zero. So I want to re-image the graph. Why we want to do this is because um, things have changed. I have new sources that I have, we deleted new things, we're learning new things. So we're going to basically run some sort of an orchestration of different sources. So we imagine Airflow from AWS or any of these very complex workflows. The workflow, the only thing that you're doing is saying, first step, just read data from this in the 
Keeping this temporary database that contains this thing, run this filter, do this, do that. But it's, it's a sequence of things. Sometimes you can do this in parallel, sometimes you do some sequencing. But the goal is that at every piece of the graph, as of the workflow, sorry, if you have a problem, you can stop it and say, oh, we don't have brands anymore. Then I cannot compute type. So what happens? So you can go back and double check and rerun it. So the goal here is you're going to orchestrate all the sources that we need to use for the graph generation and then type the new version of the graph. Okay. Because it's a workflow, we're going to version. So say that we rebuild our IMDB graph every file. So every file will have a new version of the graph. And because every Friday we have a new version, we're going to land basically a diff. So we want to check if you know the Godfather was directed by Coco. That was what we learned last week. And this week is the Godfather's directory by Professor Jan Maria. It's like, I think we have a problem because this, this relationship is such, and if that is a head entity, we might be a big problem. If this is something on the tail, we might be more. Okay, so the diff are kind of important here because we want to check that we're not regressing in quality. So if you didn't get the concept here, imagine like you search for CNN and you get CNN on the first one. You don't get University of Padua on the first one. But if the next time you search for CNN, you get University of Padua, it's like oh, something wrong. So you want to you have these, these checks here to make sure that you're not regressing in terms of quality. You always like, or as good as the previous version, but never worse. How do we do this? How do we know that you know what things well? One way is to, to look at the notion of reliability scores. This is um, uh, a bit of a screenshot and a summary of uh, an intern that we had working the work for the summer with us. And the idea here is that for every node, for every node in the graph, as well as for every relationship, we're going to put a reliability score. Remember the brands, we're looking for Gucci, and then we kind of basically ping all the resources and all of them say, yeah, we see Gucci. So we're super confident that Gucci is a brand. So then we can say Gucci is a brand with 40 to one or 099. That's great. But what about when we don't have good scores or we, we are unsure? So the, the idea is that we're going to derive, because we derive a graph from many different sources. And if the graph has millions of entities and issues, you cannot hire people to double check that the data is correct, even if you sample. So one way is to basically get a slice of the graph and then we're gonna run the unit test. A lot of different unit tests. Okay, so before I get into the unit test, the idea here is that you have n resources, data source one, two, n. We're going to run the ETL. The ETL is basically the workflow, you know, extraction and transformation group. So, this is the workflow. And then we have a candidate, a candidate for a graph. This is called Spitting Knowledge Graph. It looks like we have a new version of the graph. Now, we're going to run basically a lot of unit tests. And this unit test is going to give us, in this case, three different products. The node is reliable, it's green, it's ready to be used. Great, you know, Godfather is a movie directed by Francis Ford Coppola. That entity and relationship is super clean. Then we have questionable things. You know, Gucci sells running shoes. Uh, maybe, maybe not, it's just unsure. And then, uh, Something that is completely unreliable, which sells max. Absolutely not. So it's going to have a ref. I'm just making this up. Maybe they do sell max, maybe they do sell rank shoes. But imagine that we have an entity or relationship, and then the green to be yellow to be red. Green, perfectly fine. This is great. Yellow, usually they have a caution. Red, not even touch it. White, you'll see that in a second. So how do we run this unit test? So we're going to run a lot of unit tests on the data. And the point is that the unit test, you're going to use this to 
put some feedback loop into the data sources. Like there's a bug, right? So I did a that's in bill curious something somewhere on your data catalog source. You see this and it has all max. That's incorrect. Cannot be true. So go on and fix it. So for doing that, we will run says there are numericals. You know, if you say uh, here's a you know a bottle of wine, uh, and that should be liters, cannot be you know 20 liters in the bottle, there's something off, right? So it cannot be too, too much or too little. So that's easy. So you can just look for, for numbers. And there's a lot of numbers in all these catalogs and all these graphs, and it's easy to identify that this is a little bit difficult to be true or completely correct. Uh, we can have some constraints, we can run some clusters. Clusters here, the idea is that things should be more or less the same on the particular, you know, category. Uh, or, you know, if you're talking about smartphones, they all seem to have, you know, uh, a touch device, you know, certain functionality, and you need a power adapter and so forth. If you don't have those things, this problem may not be in that particular category. So you can use clustering to kind of look at things that kind of look the same. It's clustering practice. Uh, to identify things that are basically very anomal to the data and, and also to look at provenance. The goal here is to have a white versus a black box. We won't have a white box to check things. You don't want like a machine learning model to say, this is the prediction, but I'll tell you how I discovered the thing. You want something that is very, very easy to inspect. Why? Because this reliability scores basically debugging information for you that something didn't go well. And you want to interpret these things. So, in the case of the, the numbers that you know, calories should be higher or slower, uh, or this bottle of wine that says one little. You know, if you read it, it says, you know, 2.5 liters, that's like this problems. So you have to ex explain and interpret those things carefully. And how we publish? I know that generally you really want to know about this. So what we have is we have this knowledge graph when we say we can run Sparkle query, but as you know, some of the Sparkle queries are going to be expensive. That's going to have millions of nodes and edges. Are you going to run this on, on production? Yes, we should know. What we're going to do is we're going to publish a bit of the data as a materialized view. In this case, we call this an entity index, for example. We're going to extract of that index that we have like lots of data. We're going to extract certain features, piece of the action, piece of the action. And we're going to put it in something that I call an entity pack. This is an entity pack and explain that. And this is the data that you serve on. Okay. So if you remember the uh, example of spaghetti carbonara, that we have the SPO, and then we say we're going to build the, uh, uh, you know, the figure three model, which is everything in the single document, etc., etc. So we're going to get all these you know, things from the graphs. Imagine that we run a Sparkle query. Right, and we're gonna get from the triples that we have, we're gonna return basically key values. And those key values are gonna be key injection. Okay, so everything is, you know, uh, triples, we'll run sparkle queries, we get a lot of stuff, and then we're gonna do a, a kind of a data massage on top of that, and then we're gonna get this thing in JSON. And this one says, my key is recipe 1335, uh, 135. By five, crispy rosemary chicken and fries. Okay, type recipe. Here's the ID. You know, that's the name that you can also use. Here are the ingredients. And by the way, each ingredient has an ID, right? Remember, all entities have unique IDs. So it's like, oh, red potatoes is also an ID. Uh, garlic has an ID. Rosemary has an ID. So then when I read the JSON at runtime, already have the keys. So you have to go and get, say, which are the brands that will say garlic in pan, get all that stuff in the show. Okay. So summary, we got the graph in, you know, SQL or RDF, uh, graph DB, Neptune, AWS, whatever, fine. 
materialized piece of the action run some extractors because you're going to extract pieces as well and then we build these packs in JSONs. we put it in your online online here means maybe you have a key value store that runs in you know, azure or google cloud or, or some data address and this is basically how we use um the graph and this is what you'll see on the end of the charts and yeah that kind of finishes the story from like how to build it, how to publish it, and how to consume this data. And by the way, this is just an example of what don't, don't quote me that this is a Google brand search or Instacart or, or Bing or any of the other uh, companies. It's just a way of how to extract data from the graph, massage the data, put it in, in this case, it's key values in JSON, but pretty much any data format that you need to serve the data on that's, that's something that I didn't talk, I think is super crucial is the idea of building a specific search and browse user interface for your graph. Because you need to explore your, your data. I know there's lots of different toolkits to you know, explore data sets, in particular, you know, graphs, like D3, and very cool visualization. But the problem is they don't work because the data is enormous and it's very difficult to navigate that. And you want to build something that is very specific for your domain, not because you want to search and browse, because you want to debug. You don't have a lot of bugs. You didn't get the proper entity, the entity is going to a long relationship, the relationship has like two long entities, etc., etc., etc. Because you have, remember, the reliable scores. Then you can use the reliability scores plus the search and browse to actually device say that which you has what you're going to that's not really the case. You know why? So go back, keep on it, and browse it again. So I'm going to explain uh, a system that we also that we built it called X-ray. And you can guess why we call it X-ray, because X-ray is basically operations on top of entities and edges. And here is a screenshot of, I don't have a screenshot of the output of X-ray, unfortunately, and I'm not going to go there anymore. But this is a social card, of some of the many demos that we built. And you can see that X-ray is next to every little thing. So here, this will be uh, the results for the query uh, end run or climate change. Uh, for example, we have um, uh, articles. This is an article from the LA Times. This is, this is basically contextual vectors, like people just pointing, uh, sorry, these are signatures pointing to the article. So here, what you want is you want to X-ray this article. X-ray is an operation. So basically, the X-ray will be give me edit times .com slash slash slash, and then when you X-ray, I want to know who is talking about this link, what are they saying, what are the hashtags related to this link, et cetera, et cetera. So you X-ray the link. I can also, the, the hashtag. So X-ray the hashtag here means like, what is hashtag you change? I want to know who are the users talking about hashtag change. What are the links share about climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is nice because X-ray on itself is basically operations. We have the graph, whatever you know. And I believe I sorry, I built two or three X-rays for other domains, but once you have the graph, you just X-ray whatever. You a name, a person, an entity, an object, database, a file, etc. Then you get everything about that particular uh, item in a visual way. And because it's basically a browser, then you can keep browsing, right? So if I x ray climate change, I'll have everything about the hashtag climate change. And then I can, in this case, for example, x ray. And then you keep browsing. All right, so if you Pay a little attention for the last you know, two days. Um, what we did is basically, you know, we, we talked about how to graph and what to do graph, but I talked a lot about the utility of the data. How important it is to build and have good data sources so we can build the graph. So always rely on high quality data. Then we have to decide what is the minimum infrastructure that we need because we don't have, you don't have time, not the resources to build 
build the perfect system for the first question we want the minimum. So how do we do this? So the first one is to identify a clear use case. What are we trying to solve? Number one. Number two is select a high quality data set. We got Wikipedia, go for it. IMDB, go for it. Uh, something amazing, go for it. If you have to crawl, uh, make sure you get a high quality content. Otherwise, it's going to be tough. Ingest the data, whatever data you have, and then you can generate RDF if you want it, which I do recommend. If you don't want to do semantic web like uh, solutions, plain text, key values. Store the data in some sort of graphic, whatever, whatever flavor. I just put it there because you can use a lot of the standards. Materialize the data for consumption, which is basically this piece. Okay, you have to materialize the data for consumption because there's an application that's going to use the data, and you're not going to ask the application to learn smart code. It's going to be a little bit difficult. So what you want is you do all the heavy lifting, and you say to the app, "You want JSON? Here's the JSON. Maybe XML. Here's the XML." Maybe you know, just plain text. It's plain text. You want a CSV? It's a CSV. Okay, just to make that thing easier for the application, and then you help serve a very simple application. So basically, get this flow first, and then you iterate and say, okay, let's improve the data, let's improve the infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Conclusion: Extremely active uh, area of work in terms of research. Uh, in industry and academia, there's a combination of many techniques. There's no single recipe to create a knowledge graph. That's probably the, the TLDR for the book. There's no single recipe. And the second TLDR is data books. Knowledge graph is just data. That's what it is. It's very important to use high quality sources, identify the minimum infrastructure that you need for building the system, have a clear use case. In if you don't have a use case in mind, you can build the data, but you're not going to think how the data can be used. So always have a use case in mind, at least one application. And an imperfect knowledge graph, even if you have a lot of nodes that are red, but you have you know, some of them that are really still useful because you build it and then you iterate. Okay, you put all these feedback groups and you get better and better and better. And I gave some of my references, but I'm going to tell you a lot of stuff of people that know more than I do on this topic. So Hannah Bast, who I wrote a very good, and colleagues obviously wrote a very good uh, survey on semantic search on text and knowledge databases. So here's the, uh, the link to, to the uh, uh, manuscript. Then you have uh, Yara Baikum, who runs uh, Max Planck, those are the guys behind Yago. This machine knowledge, creation and curation of comprehensive knowledge bases, also is co authored by Fabian, who gave it to uh, Kino at Cyrus, but also Yuna Dong, who is responsible for the Amazon Knowledge Graph. Extremely you know, great summary of kind of a perspective from the database. Okay, that's why it's on databases. Hana is more on the IR side. Okay, and all I just published also a big uh, survey in ACM on knowledge graphs that will have definitions, you know, terminology, different ways of graphs, uh, storage, and a few things that you can cover, like you know, evaluation, etc. It has a ton of references as well. Friedman and others, um, they have. Uh, Nice article a few years ago in the ACM where they talk about interscale knowledge graphs. This is basically the Microsoft perspective, the uh, Facebook perspective, the eBay perspective, etc. etc. What's the summary? They're all different. All of them have different perspectives of how to build a graph. Christian Battle, who is a professor in uh, Norway, but also joined uh, Google recently, he wrote this great book called Entity Oriented uh, Search. Uh, it's available on PDF by Springer. Then Laura Diaz, colleagues, they gave a nice tutorial in 2018 about using cases for protection with IR. And then Surman Chakravarti, uh, also in 2018, 
knowledge extraction, and inference from text. So you may question me and say, well, what the heck are you talking about here? So all I try to do is, none of these guys, although I love everything that they've done, they give me the full picture. Okay, each of these things is just a, a view on a piece of the, I know what picture that you end to end, the full inch, uh, full Mexican dish. So the idea here, my contribution is to give you, this, this is the idea. Okay, now go and pick each of these pieces and, and work on it. And that's it. Thank you very much. Actually, we made it. And uh, that's my uh, email account. And Twitter, if you get any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Brian, for your time. Yes. Questions? There's no quiz, so no worries. Again, very good. Very good. Can I even stop the recording? Yeah, okay. that's why I'm going to ask.